with the compelling composer, Mr. Andre Ward. Mr. Ward, tell us a little about your humble beginnings. Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, spending time. Uh, you know, I'm very fortunate uh, to have grown up in Chicago at a time where there was a thriving uh, arts uh, program within the public school systems uh, that really kept me engaged and, and others and allowed me to be introduced to this platform of music, uh, which is a expression of ourselves, uh, and to continue to grow. So I, I continue to be humbled and thankful for that opportunity. Oh, phenomenal. So you originally played drums and trumpet before playing the sax. Did you grow bored with the previous instruments? And what made the sax your beacon sound? Um, so um, again, another opportunity of an after school program, which allowed us to try different instruments. Mm -hmm. And I started with the snare drum. Of course, it, it was able to make a sound immediately by bang banging <laughs> on it. And uh, but from there, you know, I moved to the trumpet, which I thought was uh, very interesting. But then I had the opportunity to pick up the alto saxophone. Mm. And you know what what happens uh, sometimes when you just know and you find that niche or you find that that connection. And um, after picking the instrument up and I played it for a while, I really felt the connection that really made me want to dig deeper and really um, connect with the instrument. Okay. So what was your first live performance like as an adolescent? Can you remember? Oh, oh wow. Well, yes. I mean, you know, it was that one of those school performances. Uh -huh. But, you know, um, I remember being in the jazz band in my uh, middle school. Again, you know, very humbled and lucky that we had a thriving arts program. Mm -hmm. uh, in Chicago area and I had like this little solo it was a very small solo but I got a chance to stand up and play the solo and um it was a great feeling so it was like oh wow everyone's watching me and but the performance itself you know that's the one thing about the arts um I think it's so important and so instrumental to keep in front of all young students because it's an avenue to give them an opportunity to speak. I mean, you know, they could be having uh, just some challenges in math or ELA or language arts, but then you have the arts that could really make that balance. And so for me, you know, it's important to have that in the school, but for me at that time as a student, that performance really changed, um, really gave me that plateau of, wow, this is something, I had that aha moment. Aha, uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, how did that make you feel when Trump wanted to cut the arts program from schools or just that, you know, I, I think I remember with the election that he was in, that was a big, that was a big cut because uh, we experienced it here in North Carolina where they were just trying to take it away. So did you, do you know that? Did you know that? Well, yes. And, and unfortunately, when you know, there's a lot of hurdles, you know, mm -hmm. with school budgets and budgets in and out. And I know at one point, there, uh, the arts was one of the first things that was looked at to mm -hmm. hey, if you want to balance your budget. Uh, why don't we get rid of general music? Why don't we get rid of, you know, um, uh, some, some of the, you know, violin classes and things of that nature? Over the past, I would say, five years, that has changed. Uh, right. I, I hear more and more of the importance of music education being in the school systems. Right. But yeah, unfortunately, there was a time, and I'm and I'm sure that, and there are some places where this still exists. But when uh, it comes to budget, one of the first things looked at, but it's such an important, it's such an important um, fact of how someone can develop as a human being. It's, right. it's, it's important that the art in everyone's life. Thanks. Okay. Now, how did you break into the industry as a professional composer? Um, so I, um, so my, my journey was from Chicago to Tennessee State, who just won a Grammy to receive a class <laughs> of band. So I want to give a shout out. Big um, ups. And from <laughs> And from there, yes, big ups. And from there, uh, 
uh, which, which HBCU, and that's a historical moment for all HBCUs. Mm -hmm. um, but from from leaving um, Tennessee State, I came to Boston to attend Berklee College of Music. But I also wanted to be close to New York. And uh, with the New York scene, I, I started sitting in a lot of clubs, just trying to break into the New York scene. Mm -hmm. And again, um, was fortunate enough to uh, run across some musicians and then I was asked to start you know going out with some different artists um, which you know started going out with Will Downey. Uh, I was very fortunate that Layla Hathaway was a colleague of mine at Berkeley so I did some perform performances with her as well but then I got asked to go out with Freddie Jackson and Ooh. at that time um, Freddie was you know he was the number one artist uh, at that mm -hmm. particular time. And um, that kind of took me into the industry of what it would really be like being a full-time musician, as we say, living out of a suitcase. Because if you're on tour, you know, there's constantly, um, constantly the life changes. Um, but it gave me a good opportunity to see what this industry and life was all about. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, I was able to begin speaking with... Um, record companies, record executives. And uh, I was, uh, it, it was actually Freddie's management at the time who came to me and said, you know, we, we think that, um, you, you know, you're ready to do a solo project. And so I jumped at the opportunity. Uh, of course. So <laughs> now if you play music, that must mean you write music very well. Do you have other credits for songs that fans may not know about? So I think... Um, and that's a great question. And, and because, you know, a lot of musicians may only be players. They may not be songwriters. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not be arrangers. They may not be uh, producers. Uh, some could be all wrapped in one. Uh, I think as a musician, I, I feel that it's, I feel strongly that music is a universal language. Right. And that in order for me to speak to you through my music, one, I need to have some creativity. That's right. But, and two, if I fail to move you in some way with my music, then I have not done my job. Thanks. Because music should be able, you should be able to feel the music or feel the conversation that I'm trying to relate musically. And so I felt it was very important to get into the composing aspect of it because it's how I felt. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's the one key. I think that's that other feeling you get from not just being a musician playing the music right but being a musician and creating the music and it's just right. so instrumental um because it's a universal language that's right and you're we're talking about your connection to it uh, overall so um you have worked with k john or recently more so too now what and what is the creative process like for a composer like you? Um, do you write and develop in stages? Do you depend solely on the gist of other songwriters too? Like, what is that like when you both completed this this newest single? How did you collaborate? Um, so, you know, music comes in so many different shapes and forms and it really mm -hmm. takes a team uh, because you know what you're feeling and your ideas can be different from mine but collectively you know right. putting them together we can get to that one point of our expression and right. I always like to think of creating music in the studio is something that you're innovating and you're working on together to come up with the, 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 the perfect um, sequence or the perfect feeling perfect emotion Thanks. But, when you're, but when you're live you're creating a painting for that moment that will never be recreated because it's live mm. and what Kajan and I wanted to do was come together and try to collaborate both of those two two worlds you know we wanted the studio project but we wanted that feel of how would we do this if, if we was live mm -hmm. and um, it, it was a joy because Kajan had done some work on the track, sent it to me. And of course, this was during COVID. So we really were was not in the studio. We was kind of working back and forth mm -hmm. from sending the digital tracks. Um, but it was just that 
conversation of having of uh, what we was visioning and what we were feeling. Right, and right, right. Having that connection as to hey, I think that voice is is the right voice on this track. And even for me, I tried the soprano, alto, and tenor saxophone on that particular track. And wow. we ended up saying that the soprano was the one to go with because you want the right elements to really get over what you're trying to say musically. Okay. Sounds like you sink in color. So <laughs> <laughs> what exercises do you do to get over the writer's block or creativity of music? Uh, music is life experiences. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, uh, I've always said you, you can write a love song but you can't write a love song that hurts if you've never been hurt. <laughs> Facts. And I don't know who hasn't been hurt. Like, right. so, like, um, okay, you're an alien. <laughs> I know. And so what I do is, you know, when that moment strikes, uh, because, you know, because again, music is based off of your experiences and relationships. And when that music strikes, I, I try to do a couple of things. One, if I'm near a piano or studio, just go and try to put down what's in my head. But mm -hmm. I tell you, a lot of times I grab the phone, sing it right into the phone until I get to the studio so then I can start creating. Because some of those special moments, again, they're special because they're only going to happen at once. That's so right. You have to capture that essence and then try to put it together uh, for the audience and for your listeners. Okay. Now, interestingly, you have a new album out, Africa Rising. Now, I like to ask, what's the inspiration behind the record, Infusing Old with New? And are you singing on the tracks or who are the vocalists? No. Um, yeah, I'm singing with my saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, let me clear that up, okay? <laughs> as far as uh, singing uh, vocals, no, um, I left that to those who I knew could really bring and enhance uh, the project. And so I was very, very uh, lucky to have Chantel uh, to come in and do a great rendition of The Emotions, uh, Don't mm -hmm. Ask My Neighbor. Mm -hmm. uh, she also is uh, the lead vocalist on um, Secret Place. Uh -huh. And so she really brought those home. Uh, Janice Dempsey came in and she did um, Still, uh, a, a title, a track on there called Still, mm -hmm. and and then Kajan is there. And so, um, no, I wish I could do vocals like like that. <laughs> but they came in and really took the project to another level. And and we strategically, you know, sought out uh, these vocalists because of their their different sound and what mm -hmm. we were hearing, what we were hearing musically. So I hope this does not offend you when I say this. And uh -oh. usually when somebody says, I uh -oh. hope this doesn't offend you when I say this, that means they're going to offend you. But <laughs> It's almost like, uh, you know, when they say, well, with all due respect. <laughs> that's, that's when it's coming. Like, uh -oh, okay? some, something's coming. <laughs> but your work is so beautiful. It's so pristine. Uh, and I think of Kenny G when I think of your work. Uh, but, you know, as a Black composer who's doing your own thing, does other uh, saxophonists or composers inspire you to create music? Well, so first, thank you very much for saying, hey, let me make sure I let him know that I'm not trying to offend him. <laughs> <laughs> I am not offended in any way. You know, um, I continue to learn from all musicians. Mm -hmm. I know for me, um, my foundation was based off gospel, but right. I, to this day, to this day, listen to uh, Cannonball, Adelie, John Coltrane, Sonny Stitt, Charlie Parker. And these are the saxophonists that have played, paved the way for all of us now that's playing. Mm -hmm. But even with some of the uh, saxophonists today, I continue to learn from because right. we all have something different to say. Um, very funny, but but you know when I came to Berkeley, you know Walter Beasley happened to be my ear um, training teacher, but welcomed me with open arms. Wow! Um, and you know I, I love Walter with his sound, his you know how his approach. I love Najee how his de dexterity. 
Kirk Whalum, very soulful player. Um, mm -hmm. Gerald Al Albright just kind of does it all. Right. I, I listen to all these players, uh, and there's something to learn from them because they, they everyone has a different experience and what right. we're doing is saying that. So no, I, I continue to listen and learn uh, because learning never stops. It That's never right. Stops. <laughs> okay. And speaking of learning, well, first of all, tell us about the tracks Kiss of Life. And you already told us about Don't Ask My Neighbors, but what made you want to collimate those old tracks, making them new again? And how does that work when you're rebranding and revamping old songs? Although they're instrument, well, not really instrumentals because those are vocalists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the remakes. Mm -hmm. um, well, so first the the emotion, um, you know, it's kind of my roots to Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, that group coming out of Chicago. But you know, it was just such a great song. If you just mm -hmm. think of it, it was just such a great song. Don't ask my neighbor, and of course. As we were listening to this track, mm -hmm. it, 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 we 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 acknowledged that just doing an instrumental list, just doing an instrumental was not going to do it justice. Thanks. And so, you know, all the songs kind of start out with the mindset of, oh, let's do an instrumentalist because I am an instrumentalist. But mm -hmm. no, you know, when you're putting a project together and you're looking at it from a producer's lens. Right. Then you start to say, no, this track needs this or it needs this. What ingredients are missing? And so we decided, um, myself and um, Yasha, who's a great producer and great friend mm -hmm. on this project and others, uh, that that was the way to go with that track. And mm -hmm. the voice was the perfect for it. I just really had to put the saxophone on it and it was there. Uh, and that's how we kind of came up with the ingredients for that track. Kiss of Life is another one. It's a great song by Sade without touching it. However, that particular track, I did want to put my sax vocal on. Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to do another vocalist. So it, it, it again, kind of say, where do you want to go with it musically? Mm -hmm. and, uh, but with that particular track, I did try different instruments from soprano, alto, tenor, and... Um, you know, we landed on that particular sound because we felt that that was a sound that uh, that we we felt in the studio, but hopefully the audience will as well. I think they will. Um, I, I, I can assure you. Now, with jazz well, being... You. <laughs> you're welcome. With jazz being timeless music, how has that been growing with the generations? Uh, I, it, you know, that's a, I think it's a cycle. Uh -huh. um, one, I think it's a cycle because I, I'm a true believer that music never dies, it evolves, uh -huh. you know, and I think if you look at our rap music, you know, if you think about the times when bebop hit the music scene, it it was a total change. Right. Uh, it was a new era. It uh -huh. took music in another direction. Uh, rap has done the same thing, but if you think about some of the samples and uh -huh. sampling that happened in the beginning of rap. I mean, you know, you can go back and hear some classical Beethoven Fifth Symphony and things of that nature within some of those samples. Right. And so music never dies. It just kind of continues to evolve. But I do think that you have to change with the times. Right. Um, because you can't live in yesterday and create music for today, but you can merge them. That's right. That's right. You can take those experiences and some of those nuances uh, with with the experiences of today. And but that's that's being creative. That's being innovative. That's being um, uh, inspirational. And right. so I, I think it's 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 um, it's a challenge, but I do think it's a cycle. It is. I think I was watching a. Um an interview with the members of De La Soul, like from back in the eighties. And they were talking about what you just said about music recreating itself and using samples. And they actually use samples from cartoons that you weren't, you wouldn't even know that they were instrumentals from the actual cartoon. So I think that's pretty amazing that as composers, that's something that you can do, especially you um, writing music, getting vocalists to come in and sing over the tracks that not to say you have a 
bad imagination, but you have to have a pretty broad imagination to be able to read music in such a way that you can get a singer, you can get this producer, you can make these tunes and these sounds, and it's beautiful. So kudos to you. Thank you. You're not offend. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So with Africa Rising, you've had success with that. Can you tell us about that? Well, Africa Rising is a special project for us. Um, and when I say us, because, you know, again, I am team oriented, you know, I can't do this alone. There's no mm -hmm. I in team. Thanks. So, you know, there are some producers and other musicians and everyone that came and worked in on the project. Um, but this was a time during COVID. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, again, music is universal language. Right. But what, what I was experiencing at that time, because we didn't have a blueprint, mm -hmm. uh, with COVID, we, we didn't really know <laughs> what was going on, but we was going with the flow. At that time, you know, what I was feeling was just kind of a sense of determination, uh -huh. hope, belief that we were going to come out of this, um, inspired to continue to do all I, I can. And that was the reflection of the, of the music. When we started putting this together, you know, Africa Rising is about, you know, the journey. Right, and having that hope and determination and love and spirit and togetherness and and how do you kind of lean on those loved ones or families as we get through this kind of gray time? Right, because right, right. We didn't we didn't have a blueprint, and so when we started constructing uh, the project, that was kind of in my soul and for some of the other uh, artists and musicians that was on the, the project, but. We also took in consideration the sequencing mm. of the project because we wanted the listeners to go on this journey with us. So okay. the sequence is you know, strategically done to take you on that journey with opening up with Classy Lady and going right into Kiss of Life. And then, and then everything going on after that is strategically done because we wanted to take the listeners on a journey with us during that time of, COVID and where we were musically and emotionally. So why was the, the album entitled Africa Rising? Well, when you think about um, Africa mm -hmm. and you think about the many challenges that they endure daily, the many right. pandemics they endu endure yearly, um, uh, the challenges that they have, the struggle that they have, but they still, um, are a nation that continues to strive and come together and mm. move forward. And so, you know, in, you know, just in thought of that, we just, you know, that one particular track was named Africa Rising, but we wanted to name the whole project Africa Rising because what we endure for this very small time of COVID is what right. they, is what they endure all the um, time, all the time. All the time. And uh, but they still continue to have the strength and motivation, and and belief, and trust and faith to move forward. And, Facts. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. So you think uh, with this album, where else do you expect to see it? Well, right now, but, well, and we're really uh, happy that right now it has really got a big buzz over in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Me personally didn't ex expect that. I, you know, know that homegrown uh, something that we would be pursuing, but it has really picked up over in the UK. That could be largely to the uh, Kiss of Life <laughs> track as well, which was very right. huge over the year. But you know, right now we're on a major awareness cam campaign. You know, coming out of COVID, just kind of picking up uh, a lot of the pieces, uh, mm -hmm. putting together a uh, promotional tour. Uh, that's going to happen later in the uh, spring and um, go into the summer and fall. And so we're looking for not only for this, not only for this project to do well, but we're looking for it to hopefully take listeners on a, on that musical journey. Mm -hmm. so if they do not feel the music or feel me, then we have not done our job. You've done your job. Let's not say that. <laughs> So, that's what I'm saying. If someone's like, oh, I'm not really feeling it. I don't feel the journey. I don't see. Because music, although it could be uh, spiritual, emotionally, 
make you cry, make you laugh. There has to be a connection to it right. some, some way, somehow. Well, you got some romantic songs on there. So I can't imagine you have Feel Good, you have uh, Bluesy. So it's a little something for everyone on there. What was your fondest memory from making this album? Like your favorite studio session? Uh, <laughs> that, that, that is a great slash tricky question because honestly, they all were enjoyable to create because they had their own different moments. Uh -huh. But I would say that the <laughs> the funniest there was a, a a track called well two one classy lady which is the very mm -hmm. first song and then there's a track called uptown uptown which is kind of an um up upbeat um kind of track and um it was just funny because both of those particular songs or tracks we almost did not do. Oh, wow. And we ended up having this very funny conversation via Zoom and FaceTiming because we were not all in the studio. Uh -huh. And so, you know, those were some fun times because it gave us an opportunity to come together again as we would if we was doing all of this live. Right, right, right. Where we sit, musicians would be in the studio. But it was just funny on how we was able to collaborate and you know, have that kind of um, real lax um, conversation on Zoom. Took us a, a longer than we expected to record it because right, right. we was fooling around so much on Zoom, <laughs> having <laughs> fun. Uh, but that was one of the funnest tracks because we was doing a take after take and no, let's not do that and do another one. And it just really became a very fun session because we was making those human connections. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah okay yeah. okay, okay. So i would say both of those yeah both of those were two of my favorites <laughs> love it so are you working on other projects what in the next coming year will you be doing yep right now we are solely uh focused on africa rising mm -hmm. um and and focusing on interviewing uh the awareness uh campaign us out and getting a tour together and i'm hoping to see uh, you and your listeners um, in your fair city sometime extremely soon. Okay, okay, okay. Can you tell? So this is my last question. I know you're excited about that. <laughs> tell our viewers <laughs> <I'm good. laughs> where to follow you and download your music. How, so your your videos are getting quite the number. Like you're getting a lot of views. Is that different now compared to how it was when you first came out? Like, what what did that do for you as an artist? Yeah, Tawana, it is different for me. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to be very transparent. It is different for me because now we're looking streaming. This whole the whole industry has changed, right? <laughs> and so it is extremely different for me. And looking at how you navigate all of this is a learning curve mm -hmm. for a lot of us but I'm up for the challenge. But yes, looking at the multiple uh, streams and views mm -hmm. is very humbling, but you know, <laughs> still dissecting like, okay, what exactly does all of this mean at the end? All right. Like, it's very humbling and, and exciting to see that uh, some of the tracks have, has so uh, as many views, views as it has gotten. So hopefully that will just continue to, uh, to happen. Absolutely. It, it means uh, monetization, okay? <laughs> that's so, so. That's where we go. That's what we want. <laughs> tell, tell people where they can download the music and follow you. So the um, Africa Rising and, and all the other Andre War projects, I have five, um, you know, for, for some of you who may know of some of the other ones, but the, the Filling You... Uh, stepping Up, uh, Crystal City, Caution, and now Africa Rising. Uh, they are all the streaming platforms, so whichever one you choose to use. Uh, Instagram and Facebook is uh, at Andre Ward Music. Try to make it very easy. Um, mm -hmm. Website is at andrewardmusic.com. That is being under construction as we speak. And so we will have all the tour dates and everything up. But Instagram and Facebook um, at Andre Ward Music. Okay, I can't wait to catch you in concert in Charlotte, North Carolina. Put that on your books, okay? Can't wait to come. You will Take be the me, first. please. You'll be the first to know. 
So you, you can come in and get those uh, front row tickets and then we can do another interview after. Period. I'm there. Don't tell me that. I'm gonna hold you to it, okay? Oh no, it's on tape. You got me on. You, you got me on recording. It's there. Girl, I'm not even gonna take it off. I'm gonna save that part. <laughs> you got me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Mr. Ward. <laughs>